Hello everyone and welcome to Mountain Lake Journal. I'm Tom Halleck. This week, one of the hidden effects from the coronavirus pandemic. At the height of the crisis, during the lockdown, people who are at risk for violence were locked in for weeks or even months with their abusers. After the quarantine has now been lifted, there has been a spike in the number of reported abuse cases and the need for services to help. Our producer Michael Hansen has this week's cover story. It's fairly simple what our main goal is. The main goal overarching is to end domestic violence in society. But locally, what we, what we strive to do is to provide services and support and advocacy to victims of domestic violence in Clinton, Essex, and Franklin counties. Historically, when people thought about domestic violence, they thought about only husband and wife. And that has completely changed as society has opened up the view of what intimate relationships look like. So um, it can be a husband and a wife. Um, it can be a same sex relationship. It can be non-married spouses. It can be uh, boyfriends, girlfriends, roommates. It can be any number of people that live within the same home or that have an intimate relationship. COVID-19 is incredibly stressful. Um, it's scary. The financial stressors of being furloughed and possibly laid off, possibly businesses shutting down, um, that's horrible for, for a family, for an individual to endure without COVID-19. So adding that stress in there into a domestic violence situation, it was a recipe for disaster. We were expecting the phones to ring off the hook right off the bat. People were furloughed, people were laid off. We knew that they would be in danger, but for the first few months, it was like silent. Um, we got calls from our clients that we had already worked with, but no new calls really for the most part. If you were dating someone or married to someone that was abusing you and they would go to work, you would have an opportunity to call us. Or if you were going to work, you would have an opportunity to call us from work. But because most places of employment shut their doors, began doing things remotely, they didn't have that opportunity to call. And that's what most domestic violence providers are thinking is the reason um, that the hotlines were silent in those first few months when we hadn't reached phase two yet, where we were slowly reintegrating people back into the workforce. If you're stuck at home with the person that's controlling your every move, um, the people that you hang out with, how many times you can use your phone, what you eat, where you go, checking your odometer on your car. Um, there's, there's not a real opportunity to make a phone call. There's not sometimes even an opportunity to send an email. It's kind of heartbreaking. Um, in the first few months, it was very, very disturbing for us. When you get in a field of work like this, it's because, it's because you're passionate about this kind of work. It's because you're passionate about helping people. To not be able to help these people that you just know are in danger, it was very difficult. Around May, um, we really started seeing a rise in the hotline calls. At around this time last year, in any given year really, um, we typically see around 100 to 200 hotline calls a month. Now we're getting around 100 to 200 hotline contacts a, a week. I think when people were allowed to go back to work or when their abusers were allowed to go back to work, I think that the, the small freedoms that people are seeing as they reintegrate, as we go through the phases, that's why the, the hotline is increasing in numbers. So every victim that we assist is a completely different situation. We could get a call from a victim that we have worked with um, for a couple of weeks and they might have moved out and started fresh but they're still struggling financially and they might need food. So we might need to assist them in 
um, providing phone numbers or locations to local food shelves. For someone that's in a crisis, it could be a person calling from a police station. And then we would go and meet with them directly at the police station and assess whether or not they would be able to go into our house if they meet the criteria. And then we would bring them to the house. And from there, it would be addressing whatever their immediate emergency needs are. And that could be anything from hospital to uh, grocery store, getting food, clothing. Some people, uh, it's not safe for them to leave right away. So a lot of people will ask, why did they stay? And that's the most judgmental statement. It, does, it seems innocent, it seems innocent, but it's judgmental. Um, so instead of asking, why did they stay? Um, we should be asking, how can we help? The best thing that someone can do if they think a friend or a family member is in danger is to listen to them, believe them, support them, and make sure that any time that they offer uh, a hotline number or an agency number, that they don't do it in a text message or an email or in a Facebook message if they don't know that's the safest route to do so. If they deliver the message over the phone, make sure that that person is the only one there because although it might seem incredibly helpful, um, you just never know whether or not the abuser is listening or whether or not the abuser is going through someone's phone. So the best thing to do when you suspect that is nonchalantly ask them to go out to lunch or take a walk in the park, um, get them where they feel safe with you and then you can deliver um, the hotline information and the agency name, that's the best. If you are a victim of domestic violence, know that you're not alone. Um, we're trying to figure out new ways, new creative ways to reach you. So our hotline is available always, and we have an email that's available. So if it is safer for someone to email, if they can't call, we have an email, and we're looking into purchasing texting services as well. What we would really like to see is more funding for education. We have educators that go into the school systems and provide information on uh, red flags, healthy relationships, um, who to turn to in the community if you're in danger. And we also have our educators go into local agencies and businesses to provide that information to adults as well. Um, so one of the goals that we had this year is to start providing that information at it at a younger age, so at the elementary level, at um, information that would be appropriate for their age, like who, who is the person that's safe to turn to in your community. If we start talking about self-esteem and bullying and kindness and a sense of community at a young age and continue that all the way through middle school, high school, college, and as adults, the hope is that the more education that we can provide, um, the less that this is going to occur.